Hello friends and welcome once again to another installment of Strange Planet and it is a far stranger planet than we can possibly comprehend. And on this episode, this is going to be, I think you'll find absolutely mind blowing. Is DNA getting its instructions from somewhere beyond space and time. We'll get into that in a moment, but first, just a friendly reminder, if you'd like to get a little deeper into this podcast, Strange Planet, all you need to do is think about becoming a premium subscriber and then click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial free listening, which is always nice. We love our sponsors, but occasionally it's nice to listen uninterrupted. And you also receive special bonus episodes that are produced exclusively for premium subscribers. Now, the other way you can get a little deeper into Strange Planet is to subscribe to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum. And that's real easy to do as well. Just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca strangeplanet.ca scroll down and you'll see a portal there that we've put uh, on the web on the web page and all we need is uh, your your name and your email address and just like that you'll start receiving inner sanctum delivered right to your email inbox once a month absolutely free and i think you're going to enjoy the uh, the newsletter we're proud of it all right we are uh, going to uh, welcome a um, a recent visitor to strange planet because uh, we we spoke with Carl Gallup's very recently about his brand new book, Eyes to See, Is Our World Ready for the Coming Visitation? Talking about, well, it's such a far-reaching book dealing with prophecy and our epic prophetic times that we're living in now and the advent of certain technologies which sort of um, fit into the whole beast system, but also about the, um, the whole UFO uh, phenomenon. That's the coming visitation. But there's another aspect to this book um, about DNA and where is DNA getting its instructions? And uh, science has now proved that DNA receives instructions from outside our body. Something or someone is, t- is telling DNA what to do. Carl Gallups is the longtime senior pastor at Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in uh, Florida, and he is the author of so many bestsellers, uh, Magic Man in the Sky, The Rabbi Who Found Messiah, Final Warning, Be Thou Prepared, When the Lion Roars, Gods and Thrones, Gods of Ground Zero, uh, The Summoning, Preparing for the Days of Noah, The Yeshua Protocol, and really the sort of the the follow-up, the uh, sequel to The Yeshua Protocol is Eyes to See, Is Our World Ready for the Coming Visitation? Carl Gallops, welcome once again. How are you, my friend? Hey, I'm doing great, Richard. Thank you. It's great to be back with you. Hey, I can't wait to dive into this topic. And I do want to just say the little caveat you always do, but uh, that to read Eyes to See, you do not have to read Yeshua Protocol, even though it is a follow-up, but I do go back and help people understand the foundation of what I laid in Yeshua Protocol before I get into all this new stuff. So, So just want them to know that. Yeah, I try to write each book to stand on its own, Yet if you get two or three of them in a row and read them, it's like this whole unfolding story. It's almost like a miniature seminary education. Absolutely. Um, So this this section in Eyes to See about DNA, um, I I think it's around, what, chapter 7? Can you just kind of lay the groundwork of, you know, why a book on biblical prophecy and technology and, you know, the whole UFO faux religion— uh, delves into DNA. Yeah, thank you so much. And no, it's way beyond chapter seven. I don't remember the exact chapter. I don't mm. have the book in ah. front of me. I did write it, though. You'd think I'd know what I was talking about. <laughs> I think it's section seven. It's chapter, uh, I think it's chapter 50. Sep- uh, chapter yeah, 50. That's why I yeah. yeah, when you said chapter seven, I said, no, it's more like 40s or 50s somewhere. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. But it is, it's, sec- it's section seven. Yeah. And by the way, for the readers, again, for the listeners, your viewers, I want them to know that I write my books with short chapters, five Mm. pages each. So when you hear us say uh, chapter 50, you think, oh, my gosh, this is a 1000 book page. No, I mean, 1000 page book. No, it's not. (laughs) No, in fact, it's 400. But a hundred of those pages are notes and references and scholarly uh, assertions. And so anyway, it's an easy read. 
uh, because I write the first part in a novel format, like you're reading a novel, and then it goes into the revelations, the science, and it all relates back to what you read in that novel. So it's really cool the way the Lord has given me this idea of how to write a book to get into people's hands from 10th graders to people with PhDs, and they can all get something out of it. So thank you. But yeah, this, this information that's about DNA in this book it's a follow-up to other astounding information about DNA that was in Yeshua Protocol. I think you mentioned it the last show we did about Dr. Israel Rubenstein out of Rubenstein out of Israel, and his amazing discovery that is captured on video on the internet. And uh, but but what I've got in this book, I think, is as astounding as what Dr. Rubenstein found, or even it goes beyond that because it includes the concept of what he found. But the bottom line is, I, I I love DNA research. Now, I want people to know, I do not claim to be a microbiologist or a DNA scientist or expert, but I know how to read <laughs> and, <laughs> and I know how to research. And so many of these people who are experts in DNA are writing and or doing interviews that you can watch and get the transcripts at layman's level. So I'm at a layman's level, but I can uh, I can describe it now um, after many, many years of doing this kind of research in a way that I think everybody can understand. So here's the deal. Uh, I was watching a program with two renowned DNA experts and microbiologists. Both of them happen to be believers. I want to give that disclaimer, but, but they're not the only ones who see this. So I'm just starting with them. That's how I started. When I, when I saw this interview, I said, oh my gosh, I've got to do deeper research on this. And it led me to the National Institutes of Health website and white papers that had been written by a plethora of uh, renowned DNA researchers, experts, professors, scientists, and their explanations, and they were mind-blowingly ridiculous. And I put them in my book to show people how this is rocking the evolutionary world. It's rocking the DNA science world. Oh, there will be people that will comment under the video or, or, or even some who have doctors in front of their name, doctor in front of their name, who will try to, uh, uh, to you, you know, to... Debunk, yeah. Deprec yeah, yeah, to talk it down, debunk it, and say things like, well, uh, you just don't understand. Well, I do understand. I can understand plain layman speech from renowned scientists. And here's what they're saying. And so I said all that to set it up. These two scientists were talking, and they were talking about the complexities of DNA, which we always do. And then one of them said, listen, let me just tell you, AGCT, the four uh, proteins, that are uh, amino acids that are involved in the DNA language, if you will. It's, it's amazing. They call it the book of life. They call it a language. They call it coding. Uh, and so all of those words denote intelligence. It screams mm -hmm. intelligence. Nothing writes a book except intelligence. Nothing codes with a language that makes things happen. Uh, perfectly, that keeps the ecosystem and the globe and all 8 billion people going, except intelligence. I mean, you would think that would be common sense, but for people who have sold their souls to the evolutionary, quote, sciences, um, almost an oxymoron, evolution science, but anyway, that's another show. Uh, and so this, they're talking, and, and this one guy who's, it is, he's a professor in a major university, and this is all he he teaches his DNA con construct, and he said, here's the bottom line. Based upon what we know now, and later on in the show, I'm going to talk about the videos that you can see with your eyes, but, and all of that's in my book, too. He says, based upon what we know now, we know for a fact that the amino acids, AGCT, there's four of them. It's like, you know, computer language is a binary code, you know, mm -hmm. ones and zeros. Well, here are four. You know, well, I forgot what you call that, but it's it's but it's got four elements that make up trillions of combinations of coding to keep an ant from becoming a human and a human from becoming an ant or a stalk of wheat. I mean, it's DNA that does that. Every living thing has DNA. So he said, this is intelligence beyond our imagination. 
this coding it's like unlike anything we can replicate anything that we've ever seen or know known he basically says what i say all the time we don't know what we don't know and so we're discovering it in little chunks you know how do you eat an elephant <laughs> little bite by little bite by little bite mm -hmm. well we're still eating the elephant of dna and just because we've taken a couple of stomachfuls of, of bites, we think, oh, yeah, we, we know all about this, this process. No, we don't. And this is what they're saying. And so what he said is amino acids do not communicate. <laughs> they, you know, they, they don't communicate at this level. Of course, they have things that they do and that they produce, but they do not communicate in these intricate languages that creates, for example, a human body with 13, 14 systems, you know, the endocrine system, the nervous system, you know, the digestive system, the reproductive system, on and on and on. He said, no, no. It, and, and he says, and so they're amino acids. They just do what amino acids do, but yet there, there, there is a coding process that's going on, and now we're seeing it with our eyes, and we'll get to that in a moment, and it's mind-blowing. It's out of this universe. It's out of this world. And he said, but here's the bottom line. The coding process, the information of DNA cannot be coming from four amino acids that supposedly were, were brought into existence by a random explosion and a random chemical soup that randomly put itself together and said, I know what, Let's start coding for 8 billion people and 17 million species of life and an entire ecosystem uh, that can, you know, sustains a planet, apparently the only one in the universe that we've been able to find that has anything like this. I know what, let's do that. Well, first of all, you have to have intelligence to even come up with that idea. So, so there's, he's saying, and so we know that it's not, it appears to our eyes to be communicating, but he said, other than miraculous intervention, that's an impossibility. He said, so, he said, it has to be coming from outside, the information. Now, what I say, I think I say it in the book, and I say it as I teach it and preach it in conferences from this point forward, that look, I used to be in criminal investigations, you, you know, as, as a former law enforcement officer in one of the departments I worked for. And, and so I say, look, to do an investigation like this, you just have to examine all possibilities. First of all, there is, we don't know what we don't know. In other words, there's stuff we still just don't know. The other one is that the information is speaking, but it was previously coded by an outside intelligence. It's doing something that we see with our eyes. We see it speaking and creating, but yet we're just looking at amino acids, but we may not know you know, what exactly has been coded in that so that it appears to speak and create. Well, it doesn't appear to speak and create. It does. And so there's that possibility or that it is flatly coming from the outside. Now, I say to your viewers that are thinking, eh, how can this be? This just sounds too incredible. Well, for those of us that are believers and have, watch this, see how I do this cheap plug? Eyes to see. <laughs> for those of us that are believers and have eyes to see, we know what the word of God says. Psalm 139, I knit you together in my mother's womb. We're going to talk about that knitting process that we can see happening now. We're the first generation to see what Psalm 139, 139 3,000 years ago said was going on. And now we're watching it happen just like it said. And it's the only book on the planet that says anything like this. No other religious book in the world even says this. But in that same psalm, it also says, who can know the thoughts and the mind of God? His thoughts are like the grains of sand that cover the earth. Well, how many grains of sand are there on the earth? Infinitesimal. It's, it's out of our ability to even calculate how many grains of sand there are. And yet Psalm 139 says, you, you just don't know what you don't know. God is not a giant man floating around in space, sitting in a rocking chair. He is the creator outside of the universe. He created the universe. He knows what he's doing. We are looking in at his wonder, scratching our head. I'm going to hush and let you intervene. I've got way more to say, but um, that's <laughs> just the setup for it. It appears 
to be coming from the outside and wait till your viewers hear what the NIH uh, uh, web, uh, website white paper say about this. All right, and, and we're gonna head into a break in a moment. I just wanted to um, just glean here from chapter 50 of your book, page 210, and just sort of identify these two scientists and, and um, if I might, just read a little bit about yeah. what they said, uh, because this is a dialogue going on between Dr. Tim Standish of the Geoscience Research Institute, and he's quizzing Dr. Ryan Hayes, um, who's a PhD and professor of chemistry at Andrews University. And we have these two scientists speaking of the processes involved in the copying of DNA, which you just outlined. And it's about a half hour exchange we can see on YouTube. Dr. Standish asks Dr. Hayes what his biggest takeaway has been about the actual chemical nature of DNA following, uh, and then you provide kind of an abbreviated uh, rendition of Dr. Hayes' answer. And I just want to read from that a little bit as we head into the break. One of the things that strikes me about the chemical structure of DNA is how flexible it is chemically to allow all sorts of code and arrangement of its structure, what we call the basis of it, to allow a wide variety, almost an infinite number of chemical combinations. Even as a PhD chemist, I'm looking at the structure of DNA and pondering the structure. Once again, it struck me that there isn't anything about the chemistry that is driving the arrangement of the letters and the bases. So let's say you had a T in the sequence, anything could come after it. There's nothing chemically that says an A must uh, come immediately after a T or something like that. There are actually no rules in the sequencing of it. Now we know the A and the T must match together and the G and the C must match with each other across the strand but in any order of the rungs of this ladder, they can come in any arrangement. A reluctance of mine was to uh, give up the chemical intelligence theory. Uh, I wanted it to be that human DNA was simply full of chemicals and that we were driven by chemical information. But honestly, it's just information that has a chemical component. So there isn't a chemical property driving the arrangement. It has to come from another source. I find that utterly amazing. There is nothing that is driving the structure in the base pairs themselves. There's nothing there that's driving the chemistry. If there was something chemically driving, driving it, we would see patterns. We would see so many T's and then an A and so many G's followed by a T. But there's no patterns. It is completely random to our eyes. Uh, that's just a little bit of their... Uh, all right. Well, well I head see into a... how how much better he said that than I did. That's why. No, I no, no. I, I, I research it. I give the reader the information, and when I try to explain it in in my simple mind and language, it's it, it sometimes doesn't come out right. But that that's no, yeah, no. You did an exemplary it's... job. I just wanted people to hear it in their own words and yeah. also uh, establish their bona fides um, yes. and give them a, a name to them. All right. We'll take a quick yeah. time out. Back with uh, more on uh, DNA. Where? And from whom is DNA getting its instructions? Back with more right here on Strange Planets. Stay with us. It's a difference between night and day. Healthy, I feel rejuvenated. I love it. My skin just really started to um, even out. And I have gotten so much more energy. I've gotten a lot more um, mental clarity as well. A tablespoon every morning without fail. Yeah, everywhere I go, people are uh, always remarking on my skin and saying I look so young and so good. And, you know, I really see the difference inside. You know, I, I drink I also drink the uh, the oil that you sent me. I drink a uh, tablespoon of that every day. And then I do the oil on my face. And uh, it's a difference between night and day. I love C60 Evo, uh, especially the olive oil. I take that daily. I, lo I love it. I feel very healthy. I feel rejuvenated. I love it. I started to notice some strange things. They were positive. My skin just really started to um, even out. You know, as you get older, you get sort of lumps and bumps and discolorations. But all of that seemed to kind of go away. The blotchiness, any sort of, you know, blemishes or whatever that would just reoccur. They just went away. They finally found something that works, and that is the C60 Evo Organic Oil. Now, this is part of my daily routine. I take a, a teaspoon of it each and every single day, and I have gotten so much more energy. I've gotten a lot more um, mental clarity as well, and not to mention I can sleep a lot better at night. It's become uh, just um, such an important and vital part of my health regime and my morning 
a tablespoon every morning without fail. And if I'm staying up real late and uh, doing double duty on Coast to Coast AM, then I'll take another shot uh, uh, around uh, 10 o'clock at night. <music> Carl Gallops is with us, best-selling author, and the latest is Eyes to See. And if you want to get a copy, the best thing to do is to go to carlgallops.com, and you can get specifically right to the um, the uh, the store there, carlgallops.com forward slash eyes, E-Y-E-S, as in eyes to see, carlgallops.com forward slash eyes, and I'll put a link in the episode notes. Uh, I mean, you could go other uh, avenues to get the book, but this way you can get yourself an autographed copy, carlgallops.com forward slash Eyes. Incidentally, how is Eyes to See um, doing for you right now? How is it selling? It's, it's yeah, We're hearing from people all over the world. It's selling beautifully and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, um, it is in audiobook format. For those that like audiobook, they can get that at Amazon, of course. Um, of course, it's in a, a hard professional uh, paperback, but it's a regular-sized book and, and thick, thick cover of, with uh, paper but um you can get it that way too um and right now well as of yesterday it was number one in three different categories on amazon and each of these categories have thousands and thousands some of them tens of thousands of offerings and so it's at number one in three of them and and so god is blessing it people i'm getting we're getting emails at our offices people just going crazy over it and and i think it's filled with astounding revelations what we're talking today about today is just one just one out of probably 10 like it <laughs> and we'll cover some of those other ones in in upcoming episodes yeah. um getting back to dna and we're talking about the potential here for an external influence on the dna um how do you see that challenging the current understanding of biology i know that's a big question yeah no no it's not i address it in my book uh, thank you for asking um, no, it, it does challenge it. And that's what those two scientists you were just quoting from, from that interview, and by the way, the transcripts, not all of the transcripts, but the chunks of it in context are there in my books, like you just did. You can read it. You can see their words and read their words. Plus, I've got it referenced where you can go watch the entire interview. It, there's nothing out of context in my book. If you watch the interview, you'll see it. Well, so they're saying this, and these are two renowned scientists. Uh, admittedly believers in the word of God, but still that that is regardless of what the science says, you know, and, and that's what he's talking about. And so, but when you, when I started researching this and I always, you know, research it to the point that let me take the criminal investigator standpoint. All right, this is their, these eyewitnesses, that's their testimony. Uh, but what are other eyewitness testimonies? And where's the D where's the DNA evidence? That's funny. I didn't mean to do that, <laughs> to, to say that. <laughs> but anyway, no, where's the DNA evidence at a crime scene? <laughs> where Where's the forensics? Where Where is this? Okay, so I did that, and, it, and it, I followed the trail to the National Institutes of Health website, wherein renowned scientists are talking about this whole matter. And they've been talking about it for about a decade. But th the next thing we're probably going to talk about is what we're seeing through the microscopes. And that's only been going on a decade or less. And oh my gosh, the whole medical world's talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. But anyway, so it challenges the evolutionary theory. It challenges even what we thought we knew about DNA. Um, we know a lot. And what we know, I think, uh, from everything I've read is, is pretty accurate, except for the fact that AGCT amino acids do not in and of themselves cannot have a language that's uh, like alien outside of this world. It, it cannot. Okay, so I went to the NIH website and I began reading papers that were directed to what those two guys were talking about. Now, they didn't mention them, but it's just this is just generally known now. And it's kind of embarrassing to a lot of them. You can tell if you read what's in my book and read their papers, you see they just step all over themselves and around it. And then they challenge each other and they disagree with each other. And one tries to outdo the other one. I mean, nobody can come up with the answer. Several of them start off, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the book in front of me. It, maybe you can find it or whatever. But several of them start their white papers by saying, it is now 
a conclusively it, it evidenced fact that that somehow this language is either coming from outside or it's already coded within or we just don't know yet. I, and I paraphrase very roughly, but that's what they say is that this is this is not, not even debatable anymore now that we know what we know and now that what we're seeing what we're seeing in the microscopes. And I keep teasing this because I can't wait till we talk about it. But so they go through these gyrations and all of them, almost all of well, all of them try so hard to wind back up at evolution. And so what we want wind up with is this continued circular reasoning that evolution is so famous for, and that is we find a bone in an excavation and we say, well, it's a million and a half years old. And you say, well, how do you know that? And they say, well, look at the level, the strata in which we found it. We know that everything in there is a million and a half years old. And you say, well, how do you know that strata has everything that's a million and a half years old? And they say, well, look what we found in it. <laughs> so, you know, it's circular reasoning. And these white papers are the same thing. I, I Again, I take chunks and paragraphs out of those white papers. Usually they're beginning and their conclusion with a little bit in between. Just to give people a taste, nothing is out of context. I mean, I could be sued if it was out of context. Of course, it's not out of context. And, and, and the basic conclusion is we don't know what we don't know. So evolution must be it. And, and then, but then one of them I have that I end with that is one of the latest. They conclude that, okay, it's coming from outside, but we know where now. It came on to the earth in an asteroid. And we even know the name of the asteroid. And the asteroid had elements of these, these amino acids on it. And then they combined. And I mean, it just goes into fairy tale land that is laughable. I, I want to say to these guys, do you even read what you write before you publish it? on the National Institutes of Health website. But the, but, the, but the dirty little secret about evolutionary science, there are trillions of dollars now invested in that, in universities, in science courses, in PhDs, in courses to get a degree in evolutionary science. And there are some truths in evolutionary science. There is some science in it. But when we come down to where we are now, how did DNA get here? How did it start communicating? Why did it start communicating? How does it communicate and differentiate between all living things on the planet? All living things have DNA. And that includes plant life. It includes life under the sea. It includes life in the air. It includes our life, animal life, human life. How? How? Where are these instructions coming from? And like Dr. Standish said, they're not coming from inside the amino acids. I, I think in the book also uh, you quote um, some of these secular scientists who actually affix sort of um, the the statistical odds yes. that uh, this these um, genetic codes could line up the way that they do. do. I mean, because they it's do? such a yeah. Oh, it's, what is it like? Something like a one in a million or something? Oh, no, it's way more than that, I do believe. Again, I don't have my book in front of me, but it's all referenced, and then you can go read the papers. But the bottom line is, it's in, it, what they're saying is, it is a human impossibility. It's an impossibility. I mean, I, I mean, it's on the level of never being possible. You know, could it be in trillions and trillions and trillions of years? Maybe, but I give an illustration in there, if, if you remember, about the tsunami, you know, mm -hmm. that washes up on shore finally, and then, then it pulls back out to sea, and then you go down to the beach, and there's, for miles and miles, there's this written code on the beach in the sand that tells you how to make things, and so you start following the code, and you can begin making things that you never knew before. Well, what are the chances that by accident, a wave would wash up on the shore and leave us with a code that helps us to make things? Well, it's zero. I mean, you know, it's like, well, maybe trillions of years uh, washing up, we could figure it out. No, <laughs> no, it wouldn't happen in trillions of years. And that's what these guys are trying to say. Right. And also the idea that, uh, you know, these uh, amino acids matching up, you know, the G with the T and the T with the A and so forth. Yes. Um, yes. It, without creating errors uh, or mutations. I mean, there are some mutations 
uh, which is kind we of an live interesting. In a fallen world. Let's don't forget that we do yeah. live in a fallen world. But the yeah. idea that it is so efficient, really minimizing the number of yeah. of, mu- yes, of mu- mutations, and um, it's so non-random. That's the other right. thing. Yeah, it's why dogs don't turn into humans right before our eyes. Those mutations that might cause something like that um, are eliminated and or highly minimalized to the point that no one has ever seen a dog turn into a human. <laughs> uh, could it happen in trillions of years? You know, you can get into all the math of that, but but that's re- it gets ridiculous. It's like the tsunami washing up on the beach. And so this is what scientists are grappling with. And uh, again, I don't claim to be a scientist, but again, I know how to read and I know how to analyze things. And then I know how to find the experts that do know these things at the PhD level and the teaching level and the research level. And this is where we are. And this is relatively new, only in our generation. Hey, did you, uh, the DNA genome wasn't even, human DNA genome wasn't even mapped until I think it was 2003, 2004, mm-hmm. somewhere right yeah. in there. I mean, so that's real recent in our lifetime. And, and now we're going even deeper. And now, just a decade later, we discover this. I mean, or at least we're talking about it. It's like this cannot. Listen, I just say this. The word of God tells us what's going on and how it's going on. Even the infinite, infinitely unseeable process of weaving of the DNA until now. Now, with our technology, we actually see that. And it revealed some things that are out of this world and impossible, except we're seeing them. And now they're making animated videos of it so the world can see what they're seeing. And scientists are saying, yes, those videos, that's exactly what we're watching happen. Well, yeah, the the DNA strands, the double helix, the DNA strand, it is uh, a weaving, which you mentioned earlier, the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the chapter in the Bible or the phrase in the Bible about God saying, I, I was knitting you together, knitting and weaving, very similar. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, it's the same word. I mean, uh, yeah, knitting, knitting and weaving, if you will. Um, I mean, we use them separately as a process for what we do. But, but we're translating from Hebrew to English, and the Hebrew word itself has nuances of that. And so e- different translations will say knitting or weaving. It, it, but so, yeah, but, but that's what's happening. Can, can I talk about this now? Yes, please. Uh, okay, well, I just wanted to make sure this is where you wanted to go. Mm-hmm. So, so what's happening, as you know from looking at the book and, and, and reading it, um, <laughs> now we have videos. They're on YouTube. They're all over the Internet. And, and, I, and I even include a bunch of comments that were left publicly on the Internet from believers and unbelievers, uh, experts, doctors, people studying in medical school, other scientists, as well as lay people like you and I, you and me. Um, and I include these comments, and the comments, they're, they're going crazy. They're saying, oh, my gosh, what am I looking at here? I wish I had known this in medical school. You know, and I've been speaking incorrectly about this. Here's the bottom line. Let me give a layman's understanding. We've known for many years, or we've been teaching for many years, that you got four amino acids that communicate and determine if something's an ant or a human. Okay. Wow. Okay. Evolution. Wow. Evolution is so smart. Wow. Okay. And now we've mapped the human genome, and we know how each strand works and talks and and everything that happens. And we also know that these amino acids determine um, how to keep things going in in DNA replication processes and and carrying information, new information or correct information that's been damaged by drugs or or outside world environment and into the chromosome chromosomes of the nucleus of the cells and you know we we've known that you go to uh, school and learn all of this and we answer the questions on the test and we say wow i i'm a straight a student in dna microbiology well you're a straight a student in only what we know and and some of that is conjecture for example when we just glibly say the four amino acids are communicating what in the heck do you mean by that now that we know what we know well, but way beyond that, we now are watching DNA replicate itself. It happens at the speed of a jet engine, is what they say, the scientists say. They've slowed it down, 
and they've animated it for us. <coughs> Excuse me. They've animated it for us, and here's what blew them away. For years, we've been teaching that there are protein globules, and they've got names for them, dynein. They call them dynein motors and, you know, in, in different, different names. I don't want to bore your audience with all that. It's in the book, and you can read it. But it's in, in, in these, these globules of protein, they're kind of like worker bees, and they come and they, and they assist in this process. And again, even at that level, you have to say to the evolutionists, are you listening to yourself? Protein globules that know what they're doing and when to do it and how to work with other protein globules to make it happen perfectly mm -hmm. in a communication process of amino acids. How is this even possible? And of course, they can explain it in some some septic level, you know, of uh, of, of uh, antiseptic level, excuse me, antiseptic level of just, well, you know, this globule and this globule, and then they do this, and then, they, and then it replicates, and everything's fine. We know how it works. Actually, you don't. <laughs> You're watching something happen, but you don't know how it's working. And that's what scientists are saying now. That's what the white papers were about, but watch. So here's what we're seeing. Now they admit and show that when DNA gets ready to replicate, and by the way, this happens almost 2 trillion times a day in every human body. I mean, think of that. It's just continual, continual. What I'm getting ready to describe to you will make some people's skin crawl when they think of it because it's happening right now in your body. The DNA begins to replicate, and it takes tens of thousands of what they used to call these these globules, and you see them come into the DNA strand, and they actually go through a process of working together to unzip that DNA strand and pull down information pieces that need to be repaired or fixed or replicated, and then they compile that, and another set of globules take that information and prepare it to go into the nucleus, into the chromosome. And then other protein globules weave it back together, knit it back together. Other protein globules, they all have jobs to make this happen trillions of times a day. But what happens is that as it, as it, oh, let me turn my phone off here. There we go. Okay, it's buzzing. Okay. As it's going on, we can now see them. Brother, I know you're seated. I pray everybody watching is seated. If they don't know this, some of them know it because it's all over the internet now. Um, these globules, they're not globules. I, I, I don't know what to call them. They, we can call them machines, but they're intelligent machines. But here's the deal. They have legs and feet and arms. And they walk around each other. If one's coming in the way, it'll, one will step around. We're watching this in our most recent mic microscopes. I liken it in the book to the ultrasound technology. Mm -hmm. it, long before there was ultrasound, uh, evolutionist and government, you know, political for political means told us, ah, oh, it's just a glob of tissue and flesh. And way back, they used to say, yeah, in the embryo, it goes through all the stages of animal life. They look like little monkeys. Then they look like little pigs. Then they look like little ducks. Well, we know that none of that is true. Why? Because of technology. Now we have ultrasound. We watch the whole thing. And now even that's becoming 3D and everything else. Well, now we have the same kind of technological explosion in the research of DNA, and now we're seeing things that we could not have imagined. When you watch these videos, you think, what am I watching, a science fiction movie? No, you're watching what DNA researchers are seeing every day. And this is why these guys have hit the NIH website with their white papers, saying, don't believe what you see. Listen to us. It all happened by accident. It's, 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 it's a gaslight. It's a gaslighting because they see their whole world starting to crumble down. Now, I'm going to get comments from people saying, oh, you stupid idiot, you're just a preacher. What do you know? I know how to read. I know how to research. I know how to put two and two together and get four. And I can read what other renowned scientists are saying. And none of them have come up with a solution to what they're seeing. Not, not in a 
truly scientific manner. They keep drifting back to, well, it happened by accident. Well, there was an explosion. Well, it came on an asteroid. Well, you know, other alien beings uh, brought it here. And then the question is be begged, well, where do the alien beings come from? How'd they get their intelligence? Why would they do what they're doing? You know, there are alien beings involved in our lives. They're called demonic and angelic. And God himself, who's not from this universe. I mean, the Bible says all of this, but they don't have eyes to see. Psalm 139 again says, you've been knit together in your mother's womb. We're now watching it. It, it was right. The <laughs> Quran has nothing like this. The Hindu Vedas has nothing like this. The teachings of Buddha have nothing like this. Nostradamus has nothing like this. I'm not disparaging other people's faith systems. I mean, I get that. The evolutionists, atheists, that, that's between you, your conscious, and your creator, okay? And whatever you think that creator is. I'm just speaking truth, historical truth, literary truth, scientific truth, as we know it so far. And it's all in the book. It's all referenced. And it's not referenced by a bunch of back-channel Christian sites. I'm not ashamed to be a Christian, but I'm just telling you, these are coming from the NIH, from scientists, from PhDs, from experts, from, uh, from professors in major universities. And they're all basically saying the same thing as they step around each other when they get in each other's way. They, <laughs> they kind of look like those protein globules. We can't even call them globules anymore because the question now is big, do these things think? Mm. Can they yeah. communicate? Are they uh, intelligent entities? Entities uh, of yeah. some sort. We can call them machines. And that's okay, I guess, because we don't know what we don't know. They don't appear to have a skeleton and a brain and, a, you know, something that would keep them animated. But they're animated with legs and feet and arms. And they're thinking or they've been coded to think. Maybe they're little miniature robots. We can make robots that seem to be thinking, but they're not. But they're encoded with intelligence. Maybe it's a, it's a godlike robot that God created to help you know, to, to, to do this. They don't help do the duplication process, uh, replication of DNA. They do it. If it wasn't for them, DNA is not going to just unzip itself and recode itself and insert itself. It's got to have help. Well, that's what these so-called protein globules now are doing, are doing and have been from the beginning of time. We're just now seeing it and it is blowing people away. I've got illustrations of those globules and how they look in my book. I hand drew them, but they look, and I'm a pretty good artist, it's so that because I didn't want to violate copyright and just, you know, take, take them off other people's work, but I, I, I give credit to the video that I got it from, and then I hand draw them. And if you will go look at that video, you'll see the hand drawings are all, almost, they're identical. Um, uh, other than my own creativity put in there to, to kind of draw the line straight and everything. But anyway, you can look at them and you can get a great idea of what you're seeing, or you can go to the videos and watch them. I give all the references to them and the, and the URLs and, and where they are. And uh, it's, it's, it's just supernaturally astounding. DNA, where is it getting its instructions? Back with more of my conversation with Carl Gallops. Stay with us. It's a difference between night and day. I'll see, I feel rejuvenated. I love it. My skin just really started to um, even out. And I have gotten so much more energy. I've gotten a lot more um, mental clarity as well. A tablespoon every morning without fail. Yeah, everywhere I go, people are uh, always remarking on my skin and saying I look so young and so good. And, you know, I really see the difference. Inside, you know, I, I, drink, I also drink the... Uh, the oil that you sent me, I drink a uh, tablespoon of that every day. And then I do the oil on my face. And uh, it's a difference between night and day. I love C60 Evo, uh, especially the olive oil. I take that daily. I, lo I love it. I feel very healthy. I feel rejuvenated. I love it. I started to notice some strange things. They were positive. My skin just really started to um, even out, you know, as you get older, you get sort of lumps and bumps and discolorations, but all of that seemed to kind of go away. The blotchiness, any sort of, you know, blemishes or whatever that would just reoccur, 
they just went away. They finally found something that works. And that is the C60 Evo Organic Oil. Now this is part of my daily routine. I take a, a teaspoon of it each and every single day. And I have gotten so much more energy. I've gotten a lot more um, mental clarity as well. And not to mention, I can sleep a lot better at night. It's become uh, just um, such an important and vital part of my health regime and my morning a tablespoon every morning without fail. And if I'm staying up real late and uh, doing double duty on coast to coast AM, then I'll take another shot uh, uh, around uh, 10 o'clock at night. <music> Gallops is here. The new one is Eyes to See. Is our world ready for the coming visitation? And uh, we've discussed several aspects uh, previously on a, um, a previous episode. Right now, though, we're, we're honing in on one particular section of the book, part seven. Uh, and we're talking about DNA. And science has now proved that DNA receives instructions, it would appear, from outside our body. In other words, something or someone is telling DNA what to do. So do you think the, um, the discovery that DNA is receiving instructions from an external source might offer some insights into uh, phenomena, things like uh, consciousness, intuition, um, or what we might call divine intervention? Yes, 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 and yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, becoming self-evident now I, I loved your intro just then the three stages of truth that's so so true <laughs> and and now we're seeing that happen with dna and and yes i i think it's it's now becoming self-evident to many people and that's what again i'm not trashing him but i'm just speaking the truth that's what the atheists are now freaking out about that's what the evolutionists and usually that goes with atheism not always but it usually does um that's what they're freaking out about. And my heart goes out to them. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, look, so I've been ridiculed for all these decades because I'm a preacher and uh, you're, you're one of those religious nuts. Well, I'm not religious. Religion's what put Jesus on the cross. I have a relationship with my creator. I'm not a nut. I'm highly educated, highly degreed, and I can speak fairly well. I'm not a nut. I know what I'm talking about. I know how to read. I know how to research. I had a great career in law enforcement now, 38 years in one church, preaching and teaching all over the world. So I'm not religious, and I'm not a nut. It doesn't mean everything I say is correct. It's just that when I write these books and reference them, by people way smarter than I am about it, and some of them could be wrong. The point is, when you get a collection and now video evidence and all of this of, of these experts, I'm just showing people in my book, I'm not pulling this out of my back pocket. My, 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 you know, my understanding of this is not coming out of my head and my desire for it to point to God. It is pointing and you can just leave out the word God if you want, or Jesus, or the Creator. But it is pointing to an intelligence that we have yet to poke through and understand. How can this be? And the scientists are flummoxed by it. They don't. They don't know, and they don't admit they don't know. But the way they speak, you understand the double speak, and they start throwing in words that long, you know, so that only each other can understand the code they're speaking in. And then you realize these guys don't have a clue. They don't have a clue, and they're embarrassed by it. So it, it, all, it all ties together, as you said, brother. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, well, speaking of evolution, I mean, this might, this um, explanation about DNA and receiving intelligence and communication from outside the body, um, and we would say that, you know, that, that source is divine, it's God, um, but for the evolutionists out there and the materialists, this might be a bit of a, uh, provide a, a bridge because it could play a role in explaining what they see as rapid in, uh, advancements in human in intelligence um, um, or these mysterious aspects of evolution. Like we have sudden leaps, according to the uh, the fossil record, in, in complexity. This, this might ex explain that for them. It, yes, it might, and and I pray so. Look, again, I leave each person to their own conscience, their, their own thoughts, 
their own relationship with whatever, the power of the universe or the alien implanters or, or God or whatever. I, I, I don't, I try not to disparage people and, and I try to be gracious to all, but here's the truth. Go all the way back to the word of God and you see Jesus doing things that only God can do. He's manipulating the elements. He's walking on water. He's speaking to the wind and the waves. He feeds over 10,000 men and women and children, another 10,000 at least, with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. This, this, that miracle, for example, was witnessed by tens of thousands of people living in the time that the New Testament was written. And there's not a piece of paper anywhere on the planet that says otherwise. Nobody wrote to it, disputed it. And, and so all of this evidence piles up. And here's God in the flesh standing before the religious elite of his day. Let's call them the evolutionists because they had their box of how everything works and how it's supposed to work and how they want it to work because it makes them look smarter than everybody else. And so they were so infuriated when Jesus showed them the truth. And he said, but you have to have eyes to see. Thus the title of my book. You have to have a spirit. You have to have a longing. You have to have a hunger and thirst for truth, for righteousness, the beatitude says. And then you shall be filled. But until then, you're going to stay inside your box and you're going to scream and holler. You're going to ridicule the truth. You're going to try to explain it away. You're going to try to deny it. You're going to attack it. But in the end of it all, you will stand before the king of glory and you will say, that should have been self-evident to me. Oh, Lord, I repent. So I hope that people will come to this, this, these kinds of conclusions and see what's before their eyes and quit trying to explain it away so that they don't have to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. But many will not, brother. And the word of God tells us that. Jesus told us that. So for those that don't, it breaks my heart. It rips it out. But many will, though, I do believe. And, and I, I think even Christians that are reading my book are writing and say, oh, my gosh, this takes me even deeper into my relationship with the Lord, deeper into the word of God, deeper into my love for him and in awe of him. Uh, this, this is my final question, and it's a controversial one, some will find. Uh, it connects to... COVID, the mRNA technology. Yeah. Because thank you for bringing this up. I think about it all the time. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if we're talking about, and you and I would say, and billions of Christians around the world would say that DNA is in fact receiving its instruction from a divine source. So then what does this mean in terms of attempts by some to, um, to uh, interfere with this process, mRNA technology behind the COVID jab, uh, other attempts to genetically engineer. We've got CRISPR. We've got all of these things to try and, and manipulate our DNA. And some, and in some instances, it's for I guess noble reasons. They want to prevent right. disease and and eradicate uh, disease and so forth. But but uh, we're doing this without understanding the source or maybe in some cases under fully full well understanding the source what 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 are your what are your thoughts on this well a very simple illustration i liken your your question is great and i think about this all the time i liken it to a a a um if we can do a cheap advertisement for lego uh, mm -hmm. a lego <laughs> box of you know of pieces presented in a toy pack for a child and on the front cover is a picture of what it builds and all the pieces are there to do it. And so the child goes through it and everything and finally gets built. It's beautiful. But then the child starts moving pieces around and develops a whole different structure that maybe even the creators there of, of Legos. Now, God, you can't fool him. But maybe even the creators of Legos didn't even think about. And, and yet it's a kind of a, you know, it's a conflagration of, of the, the original. But, but it's there and there's something else that can be done. So here's the deal. God did not create us to be puppets or robots or animals, okay? We're not puppets on a string. We're not robots that God manipulates by pushing buttons. We're not animals that work largely by instinct and repetitive instinct. In other words, the only thing monkeys have, have ever done is swing in trees, uh, sling poo, uh, eat bananas, uh, you know, it, it mimic humans and, and learn a few little human-like things. That's it. 
we've put people on the moon. We've put probes into deep space. We've built the internet. We've done all this. We're like gods to them. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so the bottom line, when it comes back to COVID, no, I think about this. It's like, okay, God created us to subdue and fill the earth. Subdue means learn. Uh, I, I created a Lego building block and I put it together like I wanted it. Uh, if you keep your heart and mind on me, there are other things you can do, but they're for good. They're for good. See, the problem in, in, in the garden was this metaphorical understanding of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, mm -hmm. you see. And so, uh, so the thing is, what, I'm, what I think about CRISPR-Cas9 and mRNA, uh, you know, technology, does it have potential to relieve people of pain and suffering and other really good things? It does have that potential. The problem is we live in a fallen world. And the Bible speaks of that and, and talks about the last days before the return of the Lord. Now, I don't set dates. I just know we're living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus. And I've done that, I think, on previous shows with you. But mm -hmm. let me stay on the track here. So we're living in that fallen world. And so what's happening is things almost always start out for good. You know, the technological shifts and things. Look, we can cure cancer. We can do heart surgery. We don't have to do heart surgery. We can do stents. We can, you know, look, we can cut and snip uh, DNA now and, and, and biological material with CRISPR-Cas9. And we can fix this and fix that. Even in the womb, we can work on a baby. Oh, really? It's a baby in a womb? I thought it was a glob of flesh. Okay? Mm -hmm. You see where all this goes? And then so, but, but now... It's like, oh my gosh, we could control the world with this. We could set up our, our one world order with these kinds of things. We could make people do what we want them to do or else they can't live as long as everybody else. They can't buy or sell or trade or eat. We know how to track them now. We know how to biological material, track everybody on the planet and we can know where they are with our other uh, information communication system technologies. You see, so is technology evil? Uh, well, it can be, and it's being used for it, but it's not all evil. A lot of it's good. You and I are using it right now to get the gospel to the world, the truth. So I liken it to that. I am not against technology. I'm not against medical advancement in technology. I'm not against using it provided there's a protocol to its development and its use and, and a, a protocol to backing off if it begins to go haywire on us to fix it or to eliminate it. I mean, but these protocols seem to be being thrown out the window by the scientific community. We don't have time to do the evidence of that on mm -hmm. this show, but that's what's disturbing a lot of people. It, 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 again, I, when they first started talking about the mRNA vaccines, I mean, I was thinking, okay, vaccine. All right, good. And I mean, you know, I, I understand how that has vaccine science has eliminated almost horrendous diseases. And that's wonderful. But then, of course, the, the governments got involved and you must do it or we'll ruin your job and your life. And, you know, and, and the, wow, that sounds like out of right out of Revelation 13. You mm -hmm. either take take the mark, not that the vaccine's the mark, I'm just saying we're seeing yeah. this playing out of this kind of thinking, or else we will ruin you, we will take your pension, we will get you fired, you will not be able to buy and sell and trade and eat. That's on a little teeny level of what probably is to come, according to the Word of God. I don't know if it'll be related to vaccines and CRISPR-Cas9, but they, these serve as examples before your eyes if you have eyes to see of how quickly something good can be turned right into evil. And the word of God tells us, Ephesians 6, our battle is not flesh and blood. I mean, it happens in flesh and blood. We live in the world. It's a flesh and blood world. He says, but you got to remember behind the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> behind the curtain, the unseen realms, powers and principalities are pulling the strings and pushing the buttons. And and again, I, I use that illustration of the fish at the bottom of the five miles of ocean. They don't, they don't know we're here, therefore we don't exist. But we do. We do exist. And we are interacting in their world, and they don't even know it. And the Bible told us thousands of years ago, the same thing is happening to us. In the, in the multiverse, 
the, the multi-universe understanding of quantum physics, the multi-dimensional and portal understanding we know from quantum physics. CERN was developed to research those kinds of things, and they still are, and they talk about it all the time. Multi-universes, multi-dimensions, multi-portals, which is why Jesus spoke in that same language. I am the portal. I am the truth. I am the life. I'm the way, he said, the way. And he also said, I am the door. I am the portal. No one comes into my father's realm of existence unless they come through me. The Bible is filled with languages about dimensions and portals and other realities. God's given us a picture with the fish at the bottom of the ocean. And so we don't, we're without excuse, brother. The word of God and only the word of God speaks of these things. This is what I'm trying to tell the church today. Wake up, folks. Don't, don't be trying to change marriage and manhood and womanhood and genders and all these different things. Don't mess with that. The Word of God tells us what's going to happen. So anyway, I do think it's all connected, and I, I try to be balanced about it. I see the good in technological advancement. I do, and I'm thankful for it. But I also see the abject evil that is already with us and is coming our way at light speed. Eyes to See. Is our world ready for the coming visitation? You can get a copy, carlgallops.com forward slash eyes, E-Y-E-S, as in eyes to see, carlgallops.com forward slash eyes. I'll put a link in the episode notes. And Carl, you and I have a date. We'll talk um, in a subsequent episode about another aspect of uh, oh, yeah. this uh, amazing book. Thank you so much as always. Thank you, Richard. God bless you. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.